agradecer infinitamente a Frank Locker estar con nosotros hoy acá, de verdad es un honor contar con una persona tan importante a través de lo que él ha desarrollado en su vida como arquitecto y como persona interesada en mejorar los espacios de desarrollo para los estudiantes en el proceso educativo. Frank es un educador y arquitecto en el diseño de infraestructuras educativos, basa su trabajo en investigaciones para lograr un aprendizaje efectivo. Conferencista regional, nacional y yo introduciría en este momento internacional. Eh, Igualmente, profesor de la Universidad de Harvard en la Facultad de Diseño y columnista mensual de la página schoolfacilities.com. Recibió mención de honor del Consejo de Educación de Infraestructuras Educativas por su manejo en el diseño y proceso de construcción de la Escuela de Arte del Estado de Massachusetts. Mr. Locker orienta a sus clientes a diseñar y posesionar sus colegios para mantener una infraestructura con proyección a largo plazo a través de visualizar y mantener un plan estratégico unido al desarrollo del programa educativo y trabajo colaborativo. En su hoja de vida se evidencia gran experiencia como profesor universitario en varias universidades como en Boston, Massachusetts, en Edimburgo, Escocia, en otras universidades, Estado de Maine, etc. Conferencista, tallerista y diseñador de infraestructuras educativas. Su formación profesional, él es arquitecto de la Universidad de Oregon, PhD en arquitectura de la Universidad de Edimburgo, Escocia, y tiene un título con certificación en rediseño de infraestructuras de la Universidad del Sur de Maine. Igualmente, a lo largo de su carrera y de su vida, ha obtenido varios premios y es miembro de varias facultades de arquitectura. Eh, obtuvo el eh, premio a profesor del año de la Facultad de Arquitectura y Diseño de la Universidad de Kansas en 1981. Es becado de el Roche Traveling Scholarship, que es una institución para personas interesadas en viajar alrededor del mundo estudiando la arquitectura. Hace parte también de una organización CEFPI y obtuvo el Planner of the Year de 1999. Esta es una organización no gubernamental integrada por corporaciones, instituciones, personas y miembros comprometidos en la planeación de diseño, construcción, equipamiento y mantenimiento de infraestructura de colegios y universidades. Además, es miembro activo de la Asociación Americana de Arquitectos. Frank, thank you very much. Uh, I think we will enjoy your conference and the work we're going to do with you, and I think we can learn more and uh, do better our work and our mission. Thank you very much. Thank you. And also, um, y también quiero agradecer al doctor Alfonso Valdivieso, miembro del Consejo Máximo Asesor del Colegio, a Santiago Bernal por acompañarnos hoy en toda esta eh, mañana y tarde de trabajo y a los jardines infantiles que nos han enviado a sus representantes también eh, hoy a aprender y ver otra visión. Buenos días y vamos a lo que vinimos. Muchas gracias. I know, as I speak, I'm going to be making assumptions. Uh, we've got, you know, two, two different countries here. My, I'm going to say, you know, Colombia. I don't know all about how your system works. Um, I don't know the degree of technology that you have. I'll be making assumptions about it. If anything is completely out of line, raise your hand, and we'll, we'll talk it through. Um, and, I, and I make that note because This photograph could have lots of assumptions in it. Um, this could be the preferred learning method in the future. Students sitting on beanbag chairs and doing their work with 
with tablets or iPads or mobile phones? Most teachers aren't ready for that yet. Most students are. So we have a divide already between who we are and what we need to think about and do and what they are and they can think about and do. And part of future learning and teaching is to get that divide diminished and figure out what's most effective for students. So let me talk about that in a lot of different ways. Now this is, this is about the USA, but I think it's about other countries as well. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. It's traditional form of education. Yeah. Traditional education. This, I took this photo about a year ago in a high school in the USA. And it probably could have been taken in 90% of our USA high schools. <laughs> So does it look like your high schools? Yes. 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 Okay. And all you have to do is look at the furniture and get a sense as to what happens in the classroom. Am I right? So I'm going to show you, first I'm going to show you some slides about research. and school organization. And then I'm going to show you slides of spaces for learning and furniture for learning. And what I would like you to focus on as I show you those photos of things, spaces and furniture, focus on the question what kind of learning is happening here? What are the teachers doing? Who's doing all the talking? <coughs> How engaged are students? And are the students active? Okay, so those are the questions. So, this is history. This gets us towards the future. Students working collaboratively. Students working, students working on long-term projects with permanent desks. Students working in lounge areas. Oh, and then there's that. Well, these are examples from today. And these are happening already. And so we know how well they work. And I will make the case that our schools of the future will look more like this than what we're used to. I'll also make this case that our students are more prepared for it than our teachers are. There are two columns here. The first column <coughs> excuse me, is what I would call 20th century learning. And the second column is what I would call 21st century learning. And as an underscore, I would say that the 20th century was very much teacher-centered. But what we're trying to do now is make learning student-centered. And that's a good thing. Because in fact, the lives of teachers will get better as we focus more 
on student-centered learning. I'm not going to cover all of these, but I'm going to touch on some of them. The nature of our work in education has changed a lot. Even as short ago in the U.S., of 50 years ago, we used to think we were producing workers for an industrial age. And 50 years ago in the United States, it was really easy for, for a student to graduate high school and walk out of school and get a job in a factory. and be able to earn a living that could support a family in a job that we thought would last a very long time. And it was secure and predictable. None of that works anymore. And we are trying to produce citizens who will be successful In our, in our current world, which has no assurance, has no security, in fact, has very few jobs that you can count on for more than a short time. The prediction in the United States is that by the time a student today is 40 years old, they will have had nine different jobs. And half of those jobs haven't been invented yet. So how do we as educators prepare students for a future world where we don't know what they'll be doing. Where the only certainty is that whatever is happening today will be different tomorrow. And with that, that means our education has to change. Because the traditional approach of focusing on content knowledge with the context of history and just today doesn't work for our students who are going to be living in the future. I mean, we've got to do lots of other things as well and change. We have to change lots of other things as well. <clears throat> so we have a tradition of focusing on content knowledge. And I think you do too, right? You want your students to know math and science and history and Spanish and world languages. But now we want that and we want relationships and skills. We are shifting from what is called broadcast teaching. In the USA, we call this broadcast teaching. This, this is where this is where a teacher speaks to a, a, a classroom of twenty-five or thirty students and says the whole thing, the same thing to everybody. Oh, this is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> and we're trying to shift to personalizing learning. So that if one student's needs are different than another student's needs, they might be learning in different ways. 
Do you have the case here like we have in the U.S. of A? Where even though we might have two students who are in the same grade level, like let's say you were a seventh grade student in your seventh grade, and you were in your seventh grade, but one of you knows math at a fourth grade level, and the other and the other knows math at a ninth grade level, but you're in the same class. So how does a teacher reach both of you at the same time? And in the past, the teacher would sort of generalize, and students wouldn't necessarily understand the work, but they also wouldn't necessarily say they didn't understand the work. So we have all these disconnects. because our traditions have not been personalized. But we know to be effective, they have to be. They have to become more personalized than they have been in the past. So this is a major shift in thinking about what teachers do. We are also shifting from the teacher holding the knowledge and, and spending class time sharing the knowledge. And we're trying to shift so that the teacher is now a guide to guide students to discover knowledge on their own. and discover knowledge by working with each other, uh, collaborating, and our tradition is that teachers work alone. How many students do you have in a typical class here? 25? So that'd be one adult with 25 students? And one of the things that the modern world wants is it wants collaboration. The business world wants people who can work together. And we never paid attention to that in the past. Partly because our tradition is that teachers work well. And we're trying to shift to teachers working together. And students working together. And since in the past, when students worked together, it was sometimes called cheating. <laughs> we have some major shifts in the attitude. And in classroom management to foster learning through collaboration. <coughs> Which might even include having students give grades to their fellow students on how well they did the work. So, so, so no longer are teachers the only ones who give the assessments. And in the future world, students will be giving assessments of each other. I assume they don't do that now. Do they do that now here? Yes. In one class, in your class? Yes. But, the, but this is a good point because these ideas that I'm sharing 
may be happening here already. And maybe everybody knows about it. And, and maybe not. But it's important to find examples within your school of where these are already happening and grow from there. And, and do it more often. Yes. And do it in more rooms. Right? And that's how we grow and change. So, this, this is a big issue. And it can completely change school. And it needs some changes in your buildings, in your spaces, in order to foster that. This is another big one. We use the word direct instruction or direct teaching. To mean that process where the teacher does the talking and, and talks to a group of 25 students and the students take notes and they study in their textbooks and then they take tests. That's our tradition. We're trying to shift to different forms of learning for students, which align better with what research says is important, both from the kind of skills they need to be successful in the emerging world, and what research says is effective. So I'll show you more about that in a little bit. Okay. So, let's move on. One more thing. In our traditional schools, our content tends to be abstracted and very much school focused. And now we're trying to make real world connections, including bringing experts in from the outside world to assist teachers because they have more expertise in many areas because they have up-to-date information and because students, for some reason, tend to respect them more than teachers. And I think it's because they're too familiar with the teachers. Also, if a teacher can bring in an outside expert, the teacher no longer has to feel that he or she is the holder of all information. And the teacher can be more effective as a guide for student learning. And it's a subtle shift. It's a very subtle shift, but very powerful. So, in the United States, and I think you do this here, we have lots of ways to measure whether we're doing the right thing. Here are some of them. We, we have standardized testing. Do you have that? Yes. Yes? And when do you have that? Some, yeah. In the United States, sometimes it's every year, and sometimes yes. it's every year. Every year. Yes. No. 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 We are starting no. right now with yeah. the Prueba Saber, yeah, yes. third grade, fifth grade, okay. ninth grade, yeah. any given together. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, and so, in the U.S., this has risen to become the most important thing that most schools and parents pay attention to. 
Similar here? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, and that's a good thing and that's a bad thing. And it's a bad thing because it focuses a lot of attention on only a small part of learning. And we're trying to learn in lots of different ways. We also pay attention to these things, whether a student passes a course or not, whether they come to school or not, whether they graduate and what percentage. You probably have a very high graduation rate, so that's maybe not to worry about. Some schools in the U.S. of A. only graduate 60% of their students, and the rest drop out. That's not a good thing. Um, student behavior. Do you have any students who are behavior problems? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And why is that? <laughs> oh, oh, boring, boring. Okay. Part of it is what the student brings to school. Part of it is what you do unwittingly, and students act out at times. Right. So, so we can measure these things. Um, parent involvement. Some schools hardly have any. You probably have higher, but you have distances to travel. Long distances for parents to get there. Um, do students go to college? Yes. Okay. And at what percent? Like 95 percent. Okay. Do they get out of college? Yes. Do they, do they, in the United States, 40% of our students who go to college do not ever get out. They never graduate. <laughs> 40%. So we think we're doing really good to get them in, but we haven't prepared them for college. We haven't prepared them to get out. Stay in. And what's that? To stay in. Yeah, stay in. And so there's some other measurements that you may have or that we have. And I've got one more for you. Here's the one that I think is most important. <laughs> so what does this mean? When they leave you every day, are they excited about what they did in the daytime? We would want them to be excited about what they learned. We would want them to go and talk to their parents and their siblings and share what they learned and how, how good it was. But most students do not, right? What do they talk about when they go home? Sports? Friends? Parties? Parties? Yeah. Sleep. Sleep. Yeah. Okay. So, so we we have what? Television. Okay. Okay. So, is, is it fair for me to want them to want to talk about the excitement of school? No. It's not fair. Is it asking too much? I believe we can make schools where students enjoy their learning, where they are excited about it, and where they want to talk about it when they leave school. That means it has to be meaningful. It means they have to be engaged. It means they have to be able to feel their, their, their learning progress. And apparently we're not doing that now. But let me show you some examples of schools that are doing that. Okay. So, uh, here are some books that I think are really important for the future of education. And none of them are written about education. All of these books are all about the changing world. So Thomas Friedman, 
25, uh, 48 months on the New York Times bestseller list. His first book was about how changes in technology are changing the competitiveness of different countries in the world. And as he basically said, beware Americans. All the jobs are going to people in India and China. <laughs> That's been our, one of our biggest fears in the United States for 10, 15 years now. Because so much of the so much work can be done in other places. Where people earn less income per year and it can be done cheaper. And that's true to some extent. But then Daniel Pink comes along and his book is called The Whole New Mind and it's called, it's subtitled Why Right Brainers Will Rule the World. By right brainers he means Creative people, artists, innovators, two points to the argument. One is that our emerging world values innovation, invention, and creativity in a manner that we've never valued it before. And our new technologies empower people and students to carry out those innovations. The other is, he argues, that it's only the mundane work that will be done by people in India and China. <coughs> and the real creative work will stay in the US of A. From what little I've seen so far about Colombia, you have already started on that path <coughs> of wanting creative people in your economy. And that will just grow. <coughs> so how do we make creative people in our schools? How do we work with students over the years and nurture them so that they become much more creative? Our traditions are that we teach them to know the one right answer. But if there's anything about creativity, it is that there is not one right answer. <clears throat> so how do we shift from focusing on getting one answer to opening up opportunities for many answers? And anybody who's going to invent something new who's going to be the starter of a business and trying to sort out ways of doing things, somebody who's an entrepreneur, someone who's going to, in fact, be an artist, has to be comfortable in a mental world where there are no single answers and where exploration of many different answers is what one needs to do to get successful. Emotional intelligence. Traditionally, we have used the concept of IQ, intelligence quotient, 
as a measure of how smart a person was. Do you have that concept here? Yeah? Okay. What, what do you call it? Quotient intellectual. Okay. Quotient intellectual. Okay. So that's C I. C I. Okay. Yeah. Emotional intelligence is different. It's not what you know. It's how you navigate the world. It's how you know yourself. It's your interpersonal skills. It's how you manage stress. It's your risk-taking ability. And the research basically says that if you're looking for success, if we're trying to predict the student's success as they leave us, that 80% of success is based on emotional intelligence. So it's not how smart you are. It's how you deal with your emotions. So do we measure that at all in our schools? We measure how smart people are, right? How well they did on tests. And if this is important, it means we might need to alter the things we do in school to give students opportunity to grow their emotional intelligence. <clears throat> I'll cover this in a few minutes. This is one of my favorites. <clears throat> this is a book about the value of making things. and repairing things. And it's written by a man who has a PhD in philosophy. So he's pretty smart. <laughs> but his day job, he runs a motorcycle repair shop outside of Washington, D.C. So he goes to work every day, he gets his hands dirty, fixing motorcycles. And he's basically written a book about how that feeds his soul. And in our culture, in the United States, we have a tradition in education basically says, we're going to pay attention to what you know. And if we think you're not smart enough, we'll send you to a vocational school where you can learn to work with your hands. So our tradition is that we label students. And we think that working with your hands is lower level than, than just thinking. Same thing here. Okay? Yeah. And what we are now knowing, what we are now knowing is that thinking things is related to learning things. And that, that, that separation we had is artificial. Because in a lot of ways, making things, repairing things, is a component of engineering. And engineering is deep thinking. And also, tied in with invention. And 
so if we can get rid of our artificial separations, we will serve our students better because we can help them find their way. And I, there's a school I worked with that values this, and their slogan is tinkering becomes thinkering. <laughs> Did you do that? <laughs> tinkering becomes thinkering becomes thinking. Okay. <laughs> This book, which is about two years old now, the courses that students take in a school in the USA, will not be taught by a teacher, but will be online with computers. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Let me jump to this one. I carry this everywhere I go. I encourage schools to buy this. And I know you're getting it. 21st century skills is the concept that came out of a worldwide think tank of leading businesses in the world and leading educational organizations. But we also want 
interdisciplinary learning. So students might be learning math and science at the same time. And they might be learning history and Spanish at the same time. And maybe they're actually learning math and science and history at the same time. We're, we're wanting to make it relevant and tied to the real world. So that when a student is learning something, they know exactly why they're learning it. And the one answer that is not acceptable is because it's in the curriculum. Because, because. So, so if they're learning seventh grade math and they ask why we're learning this, the answer can't be because you will need it for 8th grade math. That's not real. That's not tied to the real world. That's internal to school. But that's often the, the, the answer that students get. Or how's this one for history? Why are you learning this? Because you will be tested on it at the end of the year. Right? Am I right? No. I'm wrong. <laughs> you got the message. So, of all those words, this is the one that I think is most important. Are our students engaged? Are they really connected to their learning? And why? Is it because someone told them they had to? Or is it because the learning is so exciting that they want to do it? So, so here we are. Look at that. The first one on your score sheet. This is called the learning pyramid. It's been around for about 50 to 60 years from the National Training Laboratory in Washington, D.C. And it outlines the rate of retention of different methods of learning. Different modalities of learning. And so, the, the modalities with the least retention are at the top, and at the bottom, where the pyramid is broader, it's the greater amount of retention. And so what this basically says is that the two most traditional methods that we use for teaching have the least amount of retention. Students forget them. And we know that they remember them for the test, and hopefully the test will be tomorrow because they will have to remember them next week. And if we use different methods, they will remember more. And if we believe that learning builds on learning, and building blocks are scaffolding, we would hope that students can remember things. And often it turns out in schools that the highest achieving students are simply the ones who have the best tools for triggering their memory. So 
they can answer on the test. But they're not the students who know what to do with the learning. Or how it fits into a bigger picture. So, more effective methods of learning. Like the audio-visual. So this is like audio-visual, right? So you're only going to remember 20% of what I said. Right? Demonstration. So science, demonstrations, that's the most common demonstration we have. That's 30%. Discussion groups. So if we, if we turn this into small discussion groups and had you answer questions with each other, you would learn more. If we had you go out and go do something with this, get up there. <coughs> And if we had you, or if you had your students teaching each other, they would learn a lot. But what do we do in schools? We only have teachers teaching people. Do you have students teaching each other? Okay. Okay. Good. That's a start. Good. So we need to find out where that happens and spread it and have more, more students teach each other. Sometimes you might have sixth graders teaching fourth graders. Yes. Students are students at the same level. Yes. Yep. Good. What's that? Science fair. Science fair? Okay. Yep. Sounds right. So how do we make all of school a science fair? Yeah. Okay. How do we make every day math day? Right? Okay.